Uh, we're going to start the program. Hopefully everybody had a, a great morning. And uh, what I'd like to do now is introduce our next speaker. Um, he asked me to keep it short and sweet and say he's a self-described airplane geek. And I said, well, that wouldn't really say anything because everybody in this room is. But, um, so he's in good company. But I would like to introduce our next speaker is Richard Abalafia from uh, the Teal Group. Uh, Richard is vice president of analysis for the group and his team of experts and analysis on service professionals founded in 1988 to research and publish timely and accurate information on the aerospace and defense industry. And I think many of us read um, Richard's work when it comes out. Uh, we're excited to have him here to, today. And what I told him was that this is going to be great because we at the end get to ask him the questions as opposed to the way it normally is where he gets to ask us questions. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Richard and uh, turn the mic over to him. Thanks, Mike. Thank well, thank you. Really deeply honored to be with you here at this conference. Um, thanks for the intro, Mike. Thank you all for uh, stopping for just a second, I know, uh, <laughs> let's just say I hope uh, PowerPoint is an aid to digestion. It probably isn't, but let's give it a shot. Uh, it's really been excellent attending this conference um, about the market. You know, I talk to a lot of people and I sense a great deal of confusion about what's going on. And I assure you, I'm just as confused. This is the strangest market environment I've seen in 26 years of looking at aircraft markets, very strange times. I'm here to walk you through what's, what I think is going on, my best guess, and where the trends are taking us, what might happen next, and most importantly, what just happened, what explains why we're in the position we're in as an industry. Now, what position are we in? Nothing says, enjoy your lunch like a blizzard of data. I apologize. I apologize for that. Like I said, I hope it's uh, an aid to digestion. But this is a trek uh, of the past 10 years of industry output on a global basis by dollar value. Um, the first column shows each segment of the industry. This is purely new build. And it shows revenue in terms of last year deliveries. First column shows what the industry did during the great years of 2003 to 2008. Second column is aggregate change in that time, and then 08 to 12. A couple things to bring to your attention. Most important things to remember. When the economy was good, we did good too. An 8% compound annual growth rate across the board, not bad at all. Industry was very healthy. Uh, then when the economy turned rather bad, uh, guess what? We still did okay in aggregate. We are the only industry on the planet, for best of my knowledge, aside from people who print government banknotes or maybe provide foreclosure services, we're the only industry on the planet that actually grew through the worst recession since World War II. A unique experience. However, here's where it got really weird. Look at all that red ink compared to black ink over the past few years. A lot of the markets, a lot of the segments of the aviation industry did exactly what classical theory says they should have done, which is they fell by about a third. You look at business aircraft, you look at civil rotorcraft, you look at regional aircraft, all of them fell by 20 to 30 percent, as all the models said they should. Now, the biggest part of this industry, of 156 billion in new deliveries last year, almost 90 of it came from large jets just Airbus and Boeing. They really are the industry drivers here. Look what they did over the past few years. They were hit by the worst economic downturn since World War II, and that accelerated their growth. That shouldn't be happening. That really should not be happening. Matter of fact, look what happened last year to the jetliner business. It grew by 29%. Those of you in supply chain management are entitled to feel a little bit exhausted after growing the industry by 29% in one year. That is a remarkable achievement. Now, why did this happen? I've just got theories at this point. Um, first of all, this is what the jetliner industry since the dawn of the jet age, 1959, has looked like historically. Um, ancient Earth historians will one day refer to the period of great cyclicality and unpleasantness that characterized this industry 
And sure enough, your typical peak to trough ratio was about a third, just like the regional corporate jet and, re and civil helicopter markets fell during the great downturn. But look what happened during the past few years and the last year in particular. We reached unbelievable new heights, fantastic record numbers. Uh, we should have been suffering grievously. And yet, in fact, we prospered. Very strange indeed. Now, when you forecast jetliner demand, it's actually kind of simple. I mean, that's the thing about my job. Pretty much anyone could do it after four to six months. You start with GDP or some other indicator of global wealth. That gets translated into airline passenger demand, airline revenues and profits, and that ultimately gets translated into demand for new aircraft. But look at this. This, of course, 2009 was the first year the world's economy not only didn't grow since World War II, but it was the first year it actually shrank a little. And this is not your, your classic V-shaped recovery either. You've got Europe still flirting around with second dip and third dip in some cases. We all read the headlines. We all know that in the emerging markets, you're seeing some disappointing numbers. And in the mature markets, the developed markets, you're seeing anemia. And in the case of Europe, just simply the ongoing risk of yet another cyclical drop. Now, the good news is, from the standpoint of modeling all of this, traffic did exactly what you say, what you think it should do. Traffic fell by, at its worst moment, about 10% in terms of revenue passenger kilometers. That's demand for seats. Cargo had this apocalyptic um, result, falling by about 20-something percent uh, during the worst of it. We made a decent recovery at first. My little favorite uh, statistical blip, that Icelandic volcano, back in uh, 2010. And where have we been since? You know, just sort of OK. We spent the past year or so with about 5% growth. Not fantastic, <clears throat> not disastrous, not nearly enough to justify the remarkable numbers we've seen. So let's get to the cause of what happened. Again, just a theory. Um, here's a quick chart of orders and deliveries. And you can see that jetliner orders fell exactly as the model said they should. They fell off to almost nothing. Deliveries, though, they just kept going. Now, some people will say that there is correlation between high fuel prices, which, again, global weirding, fuel prices should not stay high when economic demand is slack. But guess what? They did. They got even higher. There are many imbalances at work here that are confusing the entire picture. Is there correlation between fuel prices and jetliner demand? I would argue that correlation is not causation. One is an economic variable that changes over time, and the other is a market that gradually grows over time. You should not be deceived into thinking there's any connection here. I have this chart here to lie to you. Next is exactly the inverse. You might be deceived into thinking that there is a correlation between the cost of capital, an inverse correlation between the cost of capital and demand for jets. It looks like it, but again, one is an economic variable and the other is a market that's growing over time. You can see interest rates now. It's not hard to fill in the gaps on this chart. Stuck at about 0.25%. Uh, just go to your local central bank in whatever country you're in and bring a wheelbarrow and cart home some cash if you can find a use for it. Now, there's a third factor here, too, I'll discuss in a moment. But really what matters, not so much these charts, it's this chart. It's for the first time in market history, you had this massive disconnect between the cost of capital and the cost of fuel. What does this mean if you're an airline? It means you have a tremendous incentive to buy new jets, and you have people beating a path to your door, providing capital for transactions at very reasonable rates. Retail isn't 0 0.25. It's a couple points above that, but it's still at a record low. You get cash real cheap. Now, the third dimension to all of this is a lack of other investment opportunities. What has kept US interest rates so low is that there's tremendous demand for safe assets, basically government bonds. Why? Because people aren't feeling comfortable with the idea of anything riskier. There's still this tremendous risk aversion out there in the financial world. Now, you look back at the history 
of jetliner finance, whether it's operating lease or finance lease, one thing becomes very clear. This is a really safe market and you're going to make some money. In other words, you look at your opportunity to invest all that cash you have available courtesy of your local central bank, and jetliners are a really smart place to put it. And this is fantastic for us. This has resulted in that massive 29% growth, 56%, I believe, over the past five years that has propelled this industry upward and compensated for all the other weakness we're seeing in defense, regional, civil rotorcraft, and whatever else. Jetliners are not only the big driver behind the industry growth, they're our life preserver. They're the what's kept us in black ink with solid good growth numbers over the past few years. Now, a couple things I'd like you to remember though, other than don't try this at home, you know, I mean, this is just a weird combination of events. One is I'm really concerned about expectations of further growth at the rate we have enjoyed over the past decade. You added up in the jetliner business, we expanded by almost 10%, 9.5% compound annual growth for the past decade. That's really tough to keep going, especially since the causes of that are a one-off, a unique combination of events that can't be replicated. And another thing, the other thing I absolutely stress as a key takeaway from this, my wife says I'm afraid of change. You know, she's absolutely right. And in this case, I'm really afraid of change. Why? Because by definition, all change is bad change. You're not going to get lower interest rates than 0.25%. That means it's only going up. Change on the oil price side, you know, you go too high and it's really tough to make money in the airline business with current capacity. You go much lower than, say, 80 bucks a barrel and all of a sudden those really cheap, beaten up, fully depreciated 737s and A320s that are 20 years old, they look really good. They look great. In other words, what we've got is a combination of non-repeatable circumstances that if they do change, that's not good for us. So don't bank on too much more growth moving forward, and as a matter of fact, expect a certain degree of risk moving forward. But to the best of my understanding of what has just happened to this industry, uh, this is what has made us the most unique and protected industry on the planet during this recession. Now, one thing I am concerned about is expectations of further growth that you're hearing from the OEMs, and I think a lot of this is going to be executed on. This is the current plan from Airbus and Boeing uh, through 2014. It results in deliveries of about $107 billion. I think we're going to get a lot of the way there, not quite. There's inevitably going to be product, uh, there's inevitably going to be new program execution stumbles that keep the ramp up uh, from getting there. Obviously, A350 C Series comes to mind. 787 might not get to 10 on exactly the hopeful, hoped uh, timeline. But nevertheless, I'm really loath to provide straight line up projections that keep us growing beyond this. Because this is an extremely high level of growth, as you can, as you can see. Now, what's our forecast? There are a number of variables here, as you've just seen. Um, I feel really comfortable with the idea of Hess growing through 2014 and then plateauing out a bit for a while. This, in a lot of ways, is kind of a happy scenario. In other words, don't keep expecting another decade of 10% growth. Now, what are the big variable, what are the big risks moving forward? Again, interest rates, oil prices. I would also point out that right around here, you've got an issue with the divide between the current generation of single aisle planes, the A320 current generation and the A320 new engine, the 737NG and the 737 MAX. Um, it's really tough to not get people to defect basically to the next generation. Managing that bathtub is gonna be really key. People think about what would happen, what would the impact on the market be to American and US Airways not merging um, they're a key part of keeping numbers high. They have placed very large order positions that fill that bathtub between the two generations. So changes in the market like that could impact whether or not we see any kind of blip, any kind of downturn in the 2015-2016 timeframe. 
beyond that, of course, we're expecting further growth with new programs, um, and hopefully that'll be borne out. And uh, I guess my big issue there, perhaps, is that what kind of damage are you going to see to current programs as new programs come online? We all know 777X is coming, probably be an excellent plane that'll sell really well. What kind of impact will that have on the 777 line? Ditto for the A350, what sort of impact will that have on A330 sales moving forward? We already know they're going to be pressured downward. So I think in a lot of ways, what we've got here is a happy scenario and I'm a little bit concerned of some softness in the middle of it. Now one thing about this industry, it is arguably the best constructed duopoly ever devised in the history of manufacturing. <laughs> I think we know this, and a lot of it is sheer volume. Look at Airbus and Boeing backlog by value. It is a wall of volume, and anybody who wants to get into this business has to come to terms with the other guys having, well, basically $300 billion each in, uh, in backlog. What does that mean? It means if you're Bombardier trying to get in with the C-Series, you're not pricing against the average price of an A320 or a 737. You're trying to get in competing against the marginal cost to Airbus and Boeing of building a 451st A320 or 737. What is that number? Is it 60% off? Is it 70% off? Is it walk into the factory and take the plane you like? I don't know what it is. But either way, anybody who wants to enter this business has to contend with the kind of pricing power that you associate with massive backlog numbers and production numbers like these. And I think I, I've just got time for all the other market segments now. Turning over to regionals. A lot of people who get into the regional business expect to find the same kind of growing market. Guess what? It really isn't. The factors that drove the commercial jetliner market upward, the high fuel prices and the low interest rates have really not filtered down to anything smaller than 150 seats. As a matter of fact, you look at the historical trend of players in that field, it's been fewer, not more, fewer. Uh, what's sort of interesting is some of the newcomers, particularly Mitsubishi and Superjet, were doing really well, partly because Embraer kept delaying their re-engineering program for the 190 series. That got going in Paris uh, very aggressively. Uh, fantastic launch numbers. It's going to return them to industry dominance by the end of the decade. You know, fun fact, Embraer got more orders in an afternoon at Paris than Bombardier had gotten in five years with the C-Series. In other words, I would argue that in terms of new market entrance, We've known one for years, it, it's Embraer. They seem to manage their market position really well. Now turning quickly to business jets, this is a very strange example of the kind of imbalances we see in the industry. Um, yes, the broader market did fall by a third, but it really wasn't an equal third at all. If you were a business jet costing 25 million or above, a Gulfstream, a Dassault, a high-end Bombardier, you did just fine through this downturn. If, by contrast, you were a Cessna, a Hawker Beechcraft, or a Learjet, you fell on average by 56%, one of the worst market calamities to ever hit a mature segment in this industry. Uh, this is extraordinary. What's driving this bifurcation is kind of the exact opposite of what's helping the jetliner business. Third-party finance is absolutely afraid of financing anything that does not make money or is not repossessable and, you know, basically something you can put into revenue service and get some cash out of. And unfortunately, business jets fit that description. Now, if you are buying a high-end business jet like a Gulfstream, there's a 75% or 80% chance you're financing it out of the company balance sheet. Or maybe you're paying for it with a Samsonite full of cash. It doesn't matter. You don't need financing. But if you're buying a jet in the Cessna or Hawker class, 25 million or less, there is an equally large chance, 75 or 80 percent, that you, are need, you need third party finance to buy that jet. And that's where you've seen this massive sea change in financing terms. Just as financiers are very eager to get into the jetliner business, they're loath to start financing basically something that is truly a bespoke product that really doesn't earn anybody any money. 
So it's tough to get loans that are less than 60 or 70 percent of the value of a jet, and that's absolutely destroyed this market. Now, to a certain extent, uh, you've also got a bit of a, an artificiality at the top. What's starting to keep numbers high is the Gulfstream 650, which is an amazing seller. But you don't need to sell many of those to really prop up that number. I mean, it's a $65 million jet. So in other words, you might have numbers that across the board don't look that bad, but a lot of it is, you know, you know what you're building 12 650s or 24 650s or 30 650s. That's the equivalent of 100 or more Cessnas or Hawker Beechcrafts. So in other words, you're doing really well at the top end in this industry, but the bottom half is still in deep pain, and that filters down to the supplier level across the board and the user level too. Now, the most frightening aspect of this market is that, again, the models just ain't working. Uh, you look at the historic driver behind business jet demand, it's U.S. pre-tax corporate profits. There's always been good correlation going back 40, 50 years. Uh, this is one of those fly, damn you, fly moments. Corporate profits are ex they're at a record high. Even more scary, you look at the total value, the total cash holdings of corporations at an all-time high as a function of total assets. 7% of corporate assets are now held under a giant mattress somewhere. Build a bigger mattress. This is cash that is not being put into productive use, like, well, buying business jets. At this point, we're not in the realm of economics. We're in the realm of um, animal spirits, psychology, something that will drive people to say, OK, we have all this cash. And not only that, we can get more. Um, why don't we spend it? We're waiting for that magic moment when they say, you know, our Cessna citation Bravo is ancient. Why don't we trade it in for something new? I don't know why, but people just aren't doing that right now. Now, in terms of the corporate structure of the business jet market, you can see just what a profound change we're seeing. Hawker went from 8% to zero, the worst casualty we've seen so far of this economic downturn, out of business. Technically for sale, but not seeing it. Cessna grievously damaged. Uh, Embraer, the only new market entrant, but having a much harder time of growing because, of course, they're purely in the bottom half of the market. The only thing you're seeing is further strength at Gulfstream and further strength at Bombardier, who were the guys with the best top-end market positions. So it's an extremely complicated picture where the numbers superficially aren't all that bad, but A, massive restructuring, and B, what the heck is wrong with the leading indicators, and why aren't they driving a market resurgence? They should be. And that's it for civil. I'm trying to save time here at the end for questions and for you, Lau, for the, uh, the hard one o'clock stop. A few comments about defense and what's happening um, in the almighty US market. Um, you can see number one comment about that middle line, that procurement line. That's the line that buys all of the weapons uh, and the R&D line below that, the O&M line above that. People like to talk about sequestration, understandably. It's, it's, a, it's a grave danger. But I think we sort of just missed what just happened. A lot of the damage of this industry that this industry has seen is actually behind us. It's filtering through the numbers right now in terms of cash that's filtering through the system. But we went from 135 at the peak, the 165 was sort of a weird year, year when we bought a lot of Humvees and Bobby body armor and MRAPs. Uh, 135 at its peak, we're now down to about 100. Might get slashed further. But when we argue over sequestration, we're talking about going from 100 to 90, 91. That's bad, but it's not as bad as what we just went through or what we're going through now as these budget numbers filter down. That's a real cause for concern. The other thing I would point out, look at that R&D number. Jim Alba on Monday pointed out the chronic issue we have with next generation. This really wasn't much of an R&D uptick at all. And not only that, but I'll bet R&D will be hit by sequestration first and foremost. Uh, you look at that coupled with corporate IRAD, coupled with NASA, we never really went anywhere. We had this massive uptick, uptick in defense, but the overwhelming beneficiary of it was personnel and O&M, war fighting, basically fuel and, uh, fuel and ammunition and, and, and whatever else. Uh, in other words, we had a massive budget upcycle and our industry really didn't benefit from it much. And in terms of R&D, yeah, we're a bit shortchanged. 
Look at this chart. It shows the peak of defense investment as a function of total defense spending. It's a little bit different because I stole it from my good friend Byron Cowan. But he did it so well, I didn't really see the need to, uh, to change it. You can see that during the great Reagan buildup, we maxed out at about 45% of the budget going to actual investment. That means R&D, that means buying weapons, rebuilding the fleet, rebuilding aircraft, whatever else. This time around, we had this wonderful uptick in defense, but in terms of actual investment, we never did much better than 35%, 10 points lower than the Reagan buildup. So I'm really concerned here because here we are talking about a serious downturn in defense, sequestration, and whatever else. But I think a lot of the body politic thinks that we just enjoyed this embarrassment of riches, that the industry massively benefited from the defense uptick. It really didn't. We had to spend a lot on personnel. We had to spend a lot on war fighting. We didn't spend it on new technology, and we didn't spend it on procuring equipment. And I think this is going to be a, uh, a rather haunting cost of Iraq and Afghanistan for quite a few years to come. Now, when people look at the procurement budget, and I stole this one too from Tom Earhart over at, uh, at uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, he, he did it best. But basically, if you look at all of the programs, whether they're submarines, whether they're artillery, anything that's in the Pentagon budget that shows up on a chart, this is it. Now, there's only one that might stick out just a little bit. You know, it's sort of a Weir's Waldo moment. You know? I'm a little concerned here that um, if you're looking for a bill payer, yeah, JSF's your bill payer. Um, I showed this to uh, an audience, audience with a bunch of Army aviators, and uh, one of them had a great comment. He was like, my god, it's the Air Force's Comanche. Um, I, uh, I don't think it's that. But on the other hand, you can understand that you look at, going back to the Comanche years, the Army never had a problem with procurement because once they killed Comanche, it paid for everything else, LUH, CH-47, UH-60, AH-64, all of it was funded by the cash that didn't go into the Comanche. Uh, I'm a little concerned that delaying, slowing down, sending another trial balloon of killing a variant, whatever else, whatever your flavor of the day for discussing F-35 cuts is going to be driven by the realities of this big pool of cash that's just sitting there. Now, my problem with that, of course, is that right now we're stuck at 30 per year. It's really tough to get better economics, better program economics, when you're not ramping up higher than F-22 peak levels. It's a real challenge. You look at the world fighter market uh, on a total basis, the other thing that becomes clear is, this is assuming that F-35 gets executed as planned, this is fast becoming a, uh, the classic musical chair story. Here is that much slower than expected F-35 ramp up. We're right over here. Uh, right above that is Europe. Right above that is Russia. Right above that is rest of world, then non-F-35 US. This is undetermined. This is all the contests out there that have not been firmly decided, whether they're in South Korea, Brazil, Kuwait, Malaysia, UAE, many others. Uh, that are waiting to place orders. Number one thing to remember, if you would like to build a fighter aircraft beyond 2020 and you're not the F-35 or Russian, you'd better win some of those contests. Um, when American industry, and I, I use the broader American industry, lost India back last year when the French won with very high level political intervention, our ambassador resigned the next day. In other words, I don't think it was a personal thing. I honestly think he knew what was at stake. You had the world's largest export fighter buy ever in the history of the industry, and uh, I don't think we brought our A-game, frankly. And we need to amp up our efforts to get out there and bring our A-games. I, I, I forget which panel I was in, I'm afraid. I think it might have been uh, Marion's, uh, where one of the speakers uh, made the very good point that very simply that's what is disting distinguishing the Europeans right now, a very high level of political assistance for their uh, weapons industries and making sure they know that there's a lot at stake with this. Now, in terms of the fighter market structure, you go back 25 years and you can see that when things are okay in home markets, US and Europe primarily, exports are maybe a third of the business, but when things stink at home, when you do have a cyclical budget downturn, exports are actually about 72% of the industry at their peak. What we're moving forward to now, because of weakness in Europe, extreme weakness in Europe, 
and to a lesser extent weakness in the US, you're looking at a 50-50 where exports become far more important. So a lot of what aerospace corporations are doing right now, of course, is just greatly ratcheting up their efforts. The question is whether the political support will be there. And it's not just the kind of high level lobbying you want from heads of state, it's also ITAR reforms, it's also technology transfer ag agreements, because so many of these export markets are expecting you to, oh my God, actually care about them. You know, and what really distinguished the French in India was simply getting out there and saying, we know this is very much a buyer's market, we want to make you happy. I'm not so sure we did that to the fullest extent. Turning now to military transports, uh, this rather wonderful beast here, just down the road, is California's last fixed-wing aircraft, which I'd urge you to visit while it's still being built. Um, FY08 was the last year that the Air Force procured any C-17s. I think Boeing has done a fantastic job keeping exports going. Obviously, the 10 planes for India, are one campaign we didn't lose, uh, are being delivered right now. There's no reason that we can't get, they can't get a few more years out of this. I know there are a number of sales campaigns underway. Wish them all the best. Um, but by the end of the decade, unless the Air Force agrees to do something, um, this is a major challenge. And if I've got a moment, I'd quickly draw your attention to one of the major crises that we're coming to. It's not just the C-17, it's many other programs. In the space of seven or eight years, we're gonna go from nine fixed wing production lines in this country to two. One of them uh, being this guy right here, the immortal C-130, which I am reliably informed 25th century archeologists will find the production line in a, one day. It's going to happen. Um, I mean, my father-in-law flew them and is still nostalgic about them. It'll just energize her bunny, keep going. Uh, but between that and the F-35, what else? Will there be a strategic transport? We talk about the pivot to Asia. What with? I mean, this is going to be a sunset fleet of 220 planes. Oops, sorry. 220 planes. Uh, there's no R&D being spent on a follow-on model. There's no effort to preserve production at a, at a reasonably low rate uh, with a few US buys here and there. There's absolutely no vision in the government about preserving industrial base for a plane in this class, which you think would be an essential component of force mobility moving forward in a changing world. There's an awful lot of crises like these that really, really present major challenges. Uh, rotorcraft, you see very much the same thing. This is the chart for aggregate rotorcraft funding in the business. This is, I would argue, one of the, the untold crises of the business, 80% uh, of the R&D that went into rotorcraft for the past two decades have either gone into, has either gone into dead programs like Comanche or presidential helicopter, or basically one user programs like the V-22, one and a half users if you count SOCOM. Uh, very little was actually spent on new, ho new programs and as a result, we keep building, frankly, diminishing numbers of platforms that are old and that's gonna be a real problem. In aggregate, rotorcraft funding is projected to fall, according to budget documents, by 50% over the terms of the five-year defense plan. That's really bad. You look at the companies by companies, some of this can be rescued with exports, but the Europeans have exactly the same idea. Some of this can be rescued with civil diversification, but the Europeans have exactly the same idea. Uh, this is another industry that faces serious industrial-based challenges. See, the civil part of my presentation was the happy smiley face. Now it's, you know, they say in good times, an industry analyst is a cheerleader. In, in bad times, he's a therapist. And I sort of go between these segments at this point because we're sort of all over the place in terms of market fortunes and don't know which face to wear sometimes. Um, in aggregate, this market's coming down. You look at that US military uh, demand uh, market. We just had the most amazing uptick because of Iraq and Afghanistan, but, um, you know, what goes up must come down. Um, in terms of international military, hotly contested with the Europeans, um, but at least it's still rising, and ditto for civil, which you can see there with that, uh, that gold line. Uh, this is an industry that's gonna be hit. People talk about UAVs, and for good reason. Um, there is growth. The bad news is, look at the numbers on the right-hand side of the chart. From an industry impact standpoint, while it might be good for R&D and it might be good for the services people, you're talking right now 
at somewhere between two and three billion in manufacturing activity, otherwise known as somewhere around 10% of the combat aircraft market or 10% of the rotorcraft market. It's good to talk about. It's, there's some great things being done for the warfighter in terms of R&D and, and, and systems maturation. But in terms of really having a meaningful impact on the aerospace industrial base, don't look here. The other thing that has been brought home time and time again is that UAVs are actually a cyclical market, a cyclical technology. You ramp up when you need them, as we just did in Iraq and Afghanistan. And afterwards, they're going to get ramped down. You're seeing that now. Optimistically, my UAV colleagues at Teal tell me that they feel pretty good about U-class sort of systems starting to get built around here. I, this, these are the numbers they give me. I don't know how, feel, how comfortable I feel with that at all. I'm highly um, uncertain about both technology maturation and budget maturation for these programs. So in other words, I don't think you're absolutely guaranteed of more than, say, three billion, three and a half billion out of this market. Good to talk about, but not our salvation. Five minutes for questions if I stop now. Missiles, munitions, and UAVs. This is uh, obviously just more for your reference, but it shows the patchwork of systems being produced. This is a happier story of a reasonably steady state market. Turning now to the top aviation programs, the, there's two great themes in aviation that I always stress to audiences. One is that barriers to entry are extremely high. I mentioned Embraer. Since 1960, they're the only company in the world that has successfully entered the civil business of building aircraft, the only one. Uh, how many have failed? I keep a, a giant file cabinet full of them. I enjoy these stories. Um, I saw we had an exhibitor from Honda. I wish them all the best. Uh, I think there's a very good chance they'll succeed. If they do in 2014, they will be number, number two after Embraer in 50 years. That's pretty remarkable. This industry is death on newcomers. The other thing that this industry is known for, the second thing I would stress, is that volume seriously matters. You look at the top 20 programs, historical and forecast revenue moving forward, uh, it's beyond the top 20, it really trails off to nothing. Which means if you're a subcontractor or you're working on, I don't know, program upgrades or whatever else, you'd better be in the top five or 10 or frankly, you're never really gonna go anywhere. And that of course is another form of a barrier to entry in this industry. Um, I get off the stage, or rather break for questions for the last five minutes chart, is the aggregate map of industry output. It basically stresses all my themes. Um, jetliners are the big engine of growth, big blue up there. I would expect less growth moving forward, but on the other hand, we just had fantastic growth exactly when we needed it. Um, I'm expecting a bit more growth, but after that, be real careful with that straight line up. We're always going to grow 10% year over year projection. Uh, but overall, on the other hand, to sort of conclude on a happy note, not a bad industry. We were protected from the worst storm since World War II, and uh, you know, ramping up to 200 billion a year, plus another 250, 300 in aftermarket and all that other stuff, not a bad industry to work for. And with that, thank you for your time. I think I've got five minutes for questions. Uh, we got a, uh, sorry, just one second, a uh, microphone there. As a point of comparison, how many billions is the U.S. auto industry? Oh my God, I live in my own stovepipe world. That's the sort of thing I should really know. I'm going to read a book on that as soon as I get home. <laughs> Great question. Oh, you know, let's email Alan Mulally, see what he's found, right? <laughs> and then the follow-up question would be, seeing all these negative trends, what sort of markets do you think this industry should invest in? Because seeing all this negative, we need to do something different to bust out of this shape. You know, I mean, obviously, technology can act as a stimulant, historically, very definitely. I would argue that the one place that has really paid its way consistently over the years is anything, and this is anathema to engineers, and this is, oh, you know, hi, I'm the economist, and you're engineers, and terrible thing to say. It's not performance-driven, it's economics-driven, which means turbines. Turbines pay their way. Materials that get inserted into turbines that reduce fuel burn pays their way. In other words, have a focus. Don't make it purely for performance. Even in the military side, you're very much hearing this 80% solution mantra. 
No more bespoke solutions, no more, sadly, F-22s. It's now all about how to make do with either commercial off the shelf or something that 80% at, at half the cost or something like that. So I guess uh, all of you, yeah, this is one of those things, if I tried to do your job, I'd, I'd never get there. If you tried to do my job, is it, yeah, four to six months, I'm sure you'd do fine. You know, <laughs> start to think in terms of economics and how do the systems you are working on solve problems in terms of costs or in terms of anything that makes a mission doable at less expense. Uh, sir? Do you see some things that could really radically change your forecast? Entirely too many. <laughs> uh, they keep you up at night. Um, you know, the thing is that this industry is so dominated by jetliners, so you immediately focus on the biggest issues. That combination of more expensive cash, equally sluggish traffic growth, and fuel prices at 40 or 50, it sounds great for the rest of the economy, but boy, it's, it would be really, really bad news. I mean, I look at what Delta is doing uh, in terms of their decision. Delta is sort of an interesting contrarian airline. They're not taking that many new jets. They are simply, well, 717s, MD-90s, last of current generation aircraft rather than next generation aircraft. They're basically hedging in the other direction for fuel prices, uh, saying, well, it comes down to 60. We're geniuses, and they are. I mean, if it works, it, they're geniuses. You just can't predict these things. So that's overwhelmingly the biggest. Obviously, Middle East volatility, you know, I mean, so far it hasn't impinged the all important growth engines right now for the business, which are really the Middle Eastern Fifth Freedom Carriers and the Gulf Emirates, Etihad, uh, uh, Qatar. You know, I mean, at this point, they're 25% of the wide body backlog, these three carriers. You start having civil disruptions, they are getting close to Bahrain, obviously, a few years ago. You're seeing what's happening yesterday and today in Egypt. You start getting close to that, you start getting people saying, maybe I don't want to change planes in Dubai. Uh, it might not be easy to rearrange the backlog expectations here. So you know, I, those are just the top that come to mind, but uh, as I'm sure you know, there are just so many. Any other questions? Time for uh, another one or two, perhaps, if there is. Klaus. You haven't addressed the Chinese airline. Um, I'll, I'll start with a positive on, uh, on Chinese aircraft. You couldn't ask for a better combination of market, resources, and talent. Um, and the only way to not uh, succeed with that is to perhaps t take a few of the approaches they're taking. My big objection, uh, and I mean that with absolutely no disrespect to, to, to the Chinese, this is a government thing. When you mandate vertical content, uh, you're, t you're taking the exact opposite approach of Embraer. Embraer was simply said, we're going to be the Dell computers, we're going to buy everything latest and best from everybody. In China, this is a government decision, not a, you know, basically, you have to build it in country and you don't get IP protection because we're trying to do the same thing. That means people show up with stuff from 10 years ago or stuff that can't be properly integrated into the architecture. Um, that's really bad. So as a result, you've got ARJ21. I, I, I can't imagine ever a plane being launched and then dying, but it just happened. And I, 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 all the best with the C919, but it's the same mandate for vertical content coupled with no IP protection. You just gotta flip that switch and change it. Change, move to an Embraer model and you'll get better results. Mike. What's your thoughts on the Justice Department's decision yesterday to challenge the US Air American merger and, and the impacts if uh, what, what they'll have to change in the merger or if it were not to go through at all. They make me proud to live in Washington. No I'm kidding. <laughs> what a bunch of, you know, um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, capricious, arbitrary, stupid, misguided, incompetent. Those are, you know, uh, just to be diplomatic. I, I don't understand. I, I, uh, I don't understand the rationale or the timing. I really don't. It's just bizarre. I mean, what's amazing is a week ago, the EU said it was okay. You know, you've got this carrier that's being set up. Yeah, we're going to go out there and compete with the Europeans, go after Air France and Lufthansa and, and British Airways. We're going to get them. The Europeans say, eh, that's a good idea. Not much we can do. And the American says, not so fast. You know. <laughs> it's just bizarre. Incompetent. That's basically it. You know. 
that the American consumer will be far better served by two marginalized carriers trying to struggle on their own with ancient MD-80s. Yes, we all look forward to that. As a consumer, I appreciate the protection. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Anyway, with that, I, with that, I, I think um, my time is up. But thank you so much for your attention.